you think that's okay? Yeah, this is really good. The balance from the right or from the light from the right and the left is just gleaming. Oh, okay. So it's perfect. There we go. All right, cool. So you're in Phoenix? I am. Yes, I'm in Phoenix. And uh, you're in Connecticut right now or living yeah. in Connecticut. Yeah, I just did. Uh, God, let me just turn my phone off. This is my fourth podcast today. And I literally am such a badass that it doesn't even bother me. <laughs> it cracks me up because I'm like, I just, the only thing I'm comfortable doing is talking. Like, I do nothing but talk. I don't have pottery. I don't have embroidery. I don't have woodworking, but I can talk. That's good. Oh, man. It, you know what? It's great. And I feel like I have that gift as well. I love talking. My wife doesn't love listening as much as I love talking. Uh, see, but this the problem. This is why you got to live alone or with two little dogs because they have no fucking choice. <laughs> I, I have to say, too, I have two cats and the conversations with them have grown into like full formed sentences and conversations since the pandemic started. It's so. really sad. It's like I enjoyed other than the death part of the pandemic. I really enjoyed oh. it. I mean, I love staying home. I love being with only animals. I'm like, OK, now it's going to get back and it's going to get real. Oh, shit. I got to go to Phoenix on a plane. What? Oh, is this going to be your first time on a plane since Pandy pandemic? Yeah, and I'm not worried at all. Like, I just don't want to go anywhere. I like literally want to stay at home in my house and live stream. And actually, not, not even live stream. I just want to sit. Is sitting okay? <laughs> you know, it's. I agree with you. I like sitting here and not have. Now I'm getting the invitations for the baby showers and oh. weddings. Because everybody like, had to get knocked up so they have a baby now. <laughs> You know, they have a lot of nerve. Everybody's spreading their legs. Well, not me. <laughs> Don't keep me inviting anyone anywhere. Oh, well. Podcasts are the perfect contraceptives, I feel. It's uh, 100%. 100%. It's... <laughs> Who's sticking it in this? No one. <laughs> exactly. When I tell my wife I'm a podcaster, she's like, oh, it all dry down here. I'm, oh, I'm done. God, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because these two guys who I kind of mentor. Um, yeah was like, I really think they're a good match for a podcast because they're, they're straight guys, but they're very sensitive, but they don't even look like they would be. So I'm like, you know, this is a really good podcast idea. And since I'm going up, where the hell am I going? Phoenix next week? I'm like, oh, we have to take two episodes in one day and I have to like tell you what to do. So that's why we did two today. And I was just like, okay, now I'm tired. But <laughs> we're going to like bring the magic for your podcast because that's what counts right now. Oh, beautiful. And by the way, not to be creepy, but just to ask the two folks, is that Bo and Nick Scopes? Oh, Nick. Yeah, they're great. They're great I, guys. How do you know who they are? I ha So I haven't had the chance to meet Bo yet, but I had Nick and Greg from the Mangina Dialogues on my podcast a while back. And, right, um, right. and they were great. And Nick, I, I listened actually trying to do my research to that episode that you were on. And then I've also seen the clips of the was it losers with a dream that they have going on well, so that's what we take that's what they're launching it next week because i had said we try we're trying to come up with an idea for a title because titles as you know are the hardest things in books it's comedy specials whatever i always had a hard time and at one point we're sitting at the diner we're going i had the defectives defective because they're flawed guys you know uh-huh uh-huh just you're just a couple of losers with a dream which is what i used to say about all the on all the roasts so I was like, just use that. That's fine. So we decided to use that. So I love it. Oh, that's beautiful. That's a great name. And um, oh, good. Yeah. The, the clips that I've seen have been really good too, including the one where you show them how to do a proper promo. I mean, how do you not know that? That's why they need me. It's so funny because I was saying to my niece how, you know, I really am kind of mostly retired, how I like mm -hmm. don't have hobbies though. Like, what should I do? And she's like, wait a minute. Like, you're mentoring those two guys, you help this other comic with his joke writing, mm -hmm. you have dogs, you declutter, you organize, you, like, there's a lot you do that you don't count as hobbies because they don't look conventional. So I think that's, like, a good lesson for me. It's like, oh, yeah, I do a lot of crap. Oh, you know, it's really interesting because I just started counseling, well, receiving counseling. Right. And I was talking with my counselor and he was like, 
you should try instead of like a to-do list you should also do like i have done list because mm-hmm. you don't realize how much you do until you kind of write it down and that's more at like the micro level but yeah, for like a day makes but sense. it makes a lot yeah. of sense because we and we also downplay all our accomplishments you know and we also are like but what i mean what did i really accomplish in life and when you're me you do have an actual list that you can go through and go okay like i did do this Radio City, I did do Carnegie Hall, I did do these specials, but it's funny how nothing really um, makes you feel like you're done yet. Meaning, like you, nothing was a pinnacle and then, okay, now I can just sit and read a book. I don't have to accomplish anymore. I don't have to write any more lists of like, to like bucket list, but I can go, oh, all right. I did accomplish something in my life. It doesn't mean I have to stay at that level because no one's ever going to stay at that level anyway. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and actually, I've been recording and we're going, we we gracefully just walked into this, but I did want to give a proper intro to you because I feel like it is well-deserved. But everybody that's been listening and is so confused if they haven't read the title of what they're listening to, it's a comedy advice podcast with Stefan Satani, your host, where we give some advice with some comedy sprinkled in between. And today... I have a very special guest. She was the queen of mean, and now she's the queen of meaning. You may have seen her on Comedy Central's roasts of Donald Trump, Pamela Anderson, and more. She's been nominated twice for a Grammy for Best Comedy Album. She's on the documentary Hysterical on FX, and she's coming to Phoenix April 16th through 17th. Woohoo, everybody, please give your hands together for Lisa Lampanelli. I am a gift. You are so lucky right now. (laughs) You know what's so funny, though? Because, like, I do things. I Literally, I decided ever since this pandemic, if it tickles me, if it brings me joy, if there's a description of a podcast or of a show or of a documentary oh. that tickles me, I like don't even look it up. I just say yes. If it doesn't tickle me, if it sounds a little like, eh, I just yeah. say no. So it's very interesting, the stuff that you stumble into. So when you said this had some comedy advice, I was like, oh, yeah, because here's the deal. In my show, the one that's yeah. uh, going up in Phoenix and uh, hopefully around the country called Sit Down uh-huh. Shut Up. A lot of it is advice because after I retired from straight stand up insult comedy, I decided to become a life coach. I decided to quit that because I am a horrible life coach, not because I don't have good advice. My advice is killer. The problem is I want the people to change at my rate of speed and I go superhuman quick or I think they should. And that's not your job as a coach is to walk with them and let them discover me. I just tell you what to do. If you don't do it, it's your fucking problem. Cause why don't you want this great life that I have? That is uh, very understandable, especially with your track record of, I mean, you have probably completed professionally that of three different people where started off as a journalist and fact checker for spy magazine. And then, comedy for what 30 years 20 years and you know what's interesting is that first i would say 15 years of my career because i started my journalism career when i was in high school and then i was the type two who i valued money meaning not to get or spend or accumulate but mm. i put so much value on how good i was as a writer that i refused to write for the college paper, which was a great paper. It's an award-winning paper at Syracuse University because they have an award-winning journalism school. I was like, Mm -hmm. no, I want to get paid. I want to write for the city paper. So by the time I was 17, I was writing for the city paper. And then I went to Rolling Stone and Spy. And I was managing editor of Hip Parader, which was a heavy metal magazine, which is hilarious. (laughs) This is the metal mama right here. (laughs) And it's funny because I got really noticed when the joy left Mm -hmm. and I went to the comedy and with the comedy I noticed when the joy left and I retired so I think it's so great to go oh my god just notice your life and you're gonna make all the right moves yeah and I think that's really important and it's for some reason a lot of people they end up quitting way too late when things are the joy is totally drained and then I I had I had heard you say too I wanted to get out of there before people started to notice that the joy was drained from me, which I think was really important too. I always say quit things before you hate them. And people laugh, but I got out of a marriage before we hated each other and now we're friends. 
like my ex-husband, Jimmy Big Balls, almost died from COVID. And I was the one his wife called and said, call Jimmy and cheer him up in the hospital. Because I, we still are good friends. I went to their wedding. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it is possible to notice your life. Like, that's what I'm seeing of a lot of people. They don't just, they don't pick up any of the signs. And I'm guaranteed I was like that for years. But now I'm like, mm -hmm. huh. Like, even tonight, I taped two episodes of a podcast that I'm helping friends to. Yeah. Two guys mm -hmm. I mentor. Mm -hmm. I noticed during a commercial break, I got in a sincerely horrible mood. Because hmm. I guess I checked my emails and I still can't remember exactly what I read that made me in a mood that I felt like troubled. I shook it off because, you know, you do the podcast. And then I looked back mm -hmm. to the emails and it was that the guy, okay, check this out. A guy I had asked for an estimate on paving my mother's driveway was like, yeah, I tried to call you, email me questions. And it, it made me in such a mood because I was like, oh, I'm paying you and you're talking to me like this. So oh my my ego of needing to be a little bit massage, but also it is kind of a dick move for him to like talk like that. Right. So, but it's interesting to just notice it, go, okay, I notice I'm in a weird mood, breathe through it, shake it off. Let's move on and finish this. Then I'll email him later. But it's all about noticing the big noticing the small and just going okay now i could keep my life on track without letting it go off the rails yes and i'm so glad that that was the reason that your mood shifted and not me emailing you being like see you soon no. for the podcast no, you were great i was like yeah this guy's cool thank god you had little flexibility you know i was like all right he gets it oh yeah yeah not a problem at all and going back to the 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 feelings and i i I'm so new and I'm already talking about this like I've been doing Good. it for a long time. But with the counseling that I've started doing, and I've tried to focus on cognitive behavioral therapy, where um, it was, I've ex been experiencing and trying to just write down moments where I feel a specific feeling. Mm -hmm. And then now I'm trying to write down the thoughts that kind of led to that feeling. And it's been. Oh my God. You are, how old are you? 32. Good. Because that's you're nice and young, and you're gonna get this worked on. Because you know, people think feelings lead to thoughts. No, thoughts lead to feelings. So it's basically, I read the email, I think this guy doesn't respect me. I'll never get the driveway fixed. I'm letting my mother down. You know, when you travel all the way down the road, and it leads to the feeling. But yes. Then the whole thing is to go. Feelings aren't facts. Thoughts aren't facts. This guy literally might have been the nicest guy in the world who just was quick on the email, didn't was was real brisk and that's how I am in emails. I'm not sweet. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what you do is then you go, what I can control is my action. I could email back and go take your job and put it up your cunt. Or I can say <laughs> he might have been having a bad day. That might be just his mannerism. Let me just be kind. Or yes. I can find somebody else. It doesn't really matter. It's just I can't let that ruin my day. I have a mm -hmm. real hot mm -hmm. button. You're going to laugh. <laughs> I, ever since my weight loss surgery, which has been about 10 years, um, the only food you're not supposed to have ever uh -huh. again is anything carbonated. Well, of course, all I want is carbonation and I freaking have it because I break every rule. I'm a rebel. <laughs> That's the kind of comic I was. It's the kind of life I lead in small ways. Well, I, on the way to the podcast recording, I drive through a Burger King. I go, I need my Diet Coke. I get to the studio like if uh -huh. I hadn't sipped it. It was a regular Coke. Now, I oh. hate regular Coke, not the calories, the taste. I am in the worst mood and I go, I have the worst luck. Why do I not? This happens to me twice a week with different beverages because I'm obsessed with beverage. <laughs> and I go, I can control letting this get me in a pissed off mood making a joke about it is fun and i go and also i can control it because i can drive i cannot go they did this on purpose if a way if i was more famous or prettier they would have gotten it right no they didn't even see <laughs> the drive through they can't see through the fucking microphone so i go i'm gonna drive through on my way back and be very kind and they apologize uh -huh. but it's so funny how even those little things can stack up and we could take them as microaggressions well, basically, it's just some poor slob working a job like we do going, oh, sorry, I made a mistake. So yes. it's really funny. We have so what's great about this is 
we have, oh, that's my poor dog throwing up in the background because he's listening to me again. Um, he's like, oh my God, if she doesn't shut up. Um, I think we have so many opportunities to practice this cognitive stuff every day that we're going to get yes. really good at it. So I'm so glad you're doing it. Yes, I'm really excited about it. Lisa, I am so sorry. I accidentally locked my wife outside. Do you mind just like 30 seconds? If you I locked or locked? Locked, locked. That's hilarious. I, totally. <laughs> I'm going to talk to your audience while you're doing that. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. So sorry. Okay, so sorry. So, so sorry. <laughs> listen, Stefan is pretending he accidentally locked his wife out. I think that is a subliminal way of saying, hey, bitch, get out of my life. I really want to bone Lisa Lampano. I get it. Super hot. Pretty freaking sexy. This is what happens. Men have to lock their wives out just in order to feel they have a shot with me. I get that he has a huge crush on me and that he was trying to lock his wife out to bone Lisa Lampanelli. I understand. He's back. He's saying it was so, it was an accident. We all get the sexual tension happening here. Go ahead, <laughs> Steph. I think I, I walked in on the right time and I'm I'm glad you understood the the message here. So this is <laughs> this is perfect. <laughs> it happens. I'm so used to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was gonna say four podcasts a day. This is uh That was pretty of... insane. I'm not gonna that's very rare for me. I like usually try to space a lot out. But I don't know, it's like with COVID lifting, I felt I don't know. And also I did just read downsize in a major way i had been had a house in an apartment i downsized from the but that to one house there's something so freeing about having extra space and time emotionally that when people call and ask to do stuff i'm like oh cute so it's funny how you can put more in your life if you get rid of what is holding you down mm, yes that is very true. And I felt that a little bit because unfortunately, my wife and I, we ended up getting COVID. And wow. so we ended up having to put everything on hold for a little while. Thank God it didn't go to like, we didn't have to go to the hospital or anything. It was just right. bad flu for us. But, um, I, I, you know, we had commitments and work and all that where we kind of had to take it off. And then I started thinking about, okay, what do I really, because I felt way less stressed. And I was like, what do I really have to do going forward once I get out of this? And then can I minimize and, and get rid of some of that unnecessary stuff? The superfluous. Well, you know, I just recently became addicted to this podcast called The Minimalists. And they have two Netflix specials. They're so great. They do tours and stuff. Uh -huh. And um, while I'll probably never be a minimalist because I'm sentimental, I keep sentimental items. Uh -huh. um, their thing isn't like, hey, get rid of everything. It's like, get rid of what bothers you or what has a pallor to it. So basically, yes. I always wondered why I'd wear all these really expensive dresses and things on TV and have to give them away the next day because I didn't want to remember the event. Not like it was a, they were bad events, but I was like, okay, I'm done with that. So I noticed with these minimalists, they talk now a lot about now that COVID's over, the busyness is just another thing to declutter. So I'm honestly, I look at my calendar and when I see white space, I've been so happy for the past year to see white space. Like I look at this Saturday and Sunday coming up and it's blank. I, I could die. I am so happy. Like, <laughs> I hate doing things. It, that, well, I like doing things that serve me and serve the, the universe or the world. Mm -hmm. I, if it weighs me down, whether it's even a 10 minute, you know, cup of coffee, I'm like, I can't, like, I'll hate myself after. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Just curious, what does Lisa Lampanelli like to do in her free time? Well, that's the more? thing. I enjoy deep conversation. Uh -huh. I don't like frivolous conversation. I like, okay, this is like so queer, but I live and gag for a game night that is my favorite i literally have at least 40 games and then i have games that you play as punishments like if you lose you have to take a pie in the face or you have to do a jelly bean that tastes like uh, crap or whatever so i will throw together game nights a lot and the way i did it during COVID, obviously we did zoom and all that 
Mm -hmm. But now it started, you know, two people, three people. Now you could have like four or five. And I don't know, there's something really lighthearted. Because I remember, dude, literally 25, 30 years ago when I was just starting comedy, I wrote down what I want in my life. And it was, I mean, I found the list when I was decluttering recently. Yeah. It said a warm house. I mean, warm is really important to me, like temperature wise, because I'm always cold. Um, a cozy house, um, game night with friends once a week, and da, da, da. nothing had to do with career. There was literally nothing on it. And actually, there was one item that said, enough work that feels fun, but no fame. I think I even knew back then fame is a trap. It's something artificial that's put on you by others and you have no control over. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I did get fame. But now I get to not have it. So that's like super cool. So it's funny how like the things I like to do for fun would not be considered fun by anyone else. Like if I'm sitting here, okay, this is what my morning was before all the podcasts. I found this enormous box of screws and nails and like hangers for the wall. Uh -huh. I organized them into little bins and there was such happiness in going, now I know how to hang a freaking picture. You gotta understand, like this is stuff when you're that dedicated to a career, you do nothing else. Like basically 30 years of nothing but comedy. So now it's like, ooh, everything but comedy. That feels really good. So all those little things that other people did all the time, mm -hmm. I just never did. Like if I go to BJ's wholesale club or I go to mm -hmm. food shopping, I'm like, oh, this is cute. People do this. Cause I just never, <laughs> you don't I was so hyper focused that it was unhealthy yeah and did you see that documentary by the way it's a beautiful documentary on hbo about olympians and a lot of them being suicidal no no i haven't seen it spectacular and i was like oh insert comedian or actor into that because you are at such a high level of trying to get more famous and more wealth and more of this and the wealth never has to do with the money. It has to do with self-acceptance and I'm good enough. And maybe if I earn, you know, a hundred thousand a show, maybe then, maybe then I'll be loved by myself, you know, and my parents will love me. <laughs> but it's so funny how a lot of people get suicidal when that's taken away or when mm -hmm. they're down on the downside, which is what's important about you, me, people like us getting the therapy, learning that our worth has nothing to do with any of this stuff. It has to do with the inside. Yes. So I just like the fact that, oh my God, I could be on the lower side of fame now and be happier. Like, it's really weird. It's really cool, though. If you can survive the ego part, you'll be fine. It's very interesting as, as you're talking about this. And as I was researching your career and your retirement and now going into life coaching and now doing the shows, um, I don't know if you've seen the movie Soul, but... Dude, oh my God. I just did a very important podcast and I cried on it. I'm, I'm, I'm big on crying now because finally feeling feelings. Uh -huh. And I forget, oh, it was on the Last Laugh podcast, The Daily Beast. And I'm not, you know, I'm not upset that I had got teary eyed. When he says in Soul that when it becomes an obsession, it's unhealthy, I sobbed. Because oh. it was an obsession you cannot get to any level of fame without it being an obsession and that's okay mm -hmm. then when you retire your whole identity is gone and you spend years working on that or drinking drugging eating having sex whatever i got i was grateful because i was like oh at least i can work on my loss of identity yeah. And now I don't need an identity because I just get to like sit on a stage in a chair in conversation with somebody and have fun. Oh, that, that is so cool. And I was thinking back to the movie where he was just so obsessed with becoming that professional piano jazz player. And then the, the, when the other soul took over his body and did things like they went to the haircut and he oh, asked I the cried. barber how he was doing. And, and he was like, oh, he ne I, I didn't know any of that stuff. I never asked him about or about yeah. his life, so. Well, I'll tell you the truth. I've been staying at my mother's house in Connecticut because she's had to go to assist living after she had COVID and um, making over her house, you know, making it back to how it was. They had it built my parents in the 50s. So I 
have my landscaper guy, I go, dude, can we redo the landscaping like the 50s? Like my father had it. Nice. Just in honor of him because he was yeah. a person before he passed. So we're doing that. And Aww. I crack up going, oh, my God, I'm actually saying hi to neighbors. Like I've never done that. Because, like, you just don't. You're in New York City. You're in an apartment. We're going to say hi to the doorman. Like, <laughs> and it's not even like you think you're better than them. You're just like, I'm busy. Don't you know how busy I am? Right, so right. Important. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my dog runs over and plays with the big dog next door. And then the lady comes out. And then you yeah. have a moment. And then the girls across the street come over. And they're 13 and they're going, we're big fans, which is wild. Cause I think I'm going to have a big resurgence in 20 years when those girls are 30. So it just <laughs> cracks me up. So living life and notice again, noticing, noticing that it's fun to like say hi to people. Like i like literally did not have that. Oh man. That, oh, that's crazy. It's, it's exciting. <laughs> it's like a good way to live the last 30 year life. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. And it's so, it's so funny when I live in Arizona, Phoenix, grew up on a farm, then moved to New York City. And I remember like trying to smile at strangers and they were not having it. Later I learned you, that's just not proper etiquette. They'll think you're a crazy person. Yes, and, yes. And it's just kind of like you said, you, you got things to do and places to be and you don't have time for smiles or casual conversation yeah. with your sandwich artist at Subway. So. Right. Right. Well, even when you're talking with comedy, like people be like, oh, my God, you get to travel around. I get who cares? What do yeah. we see? A hotel, an airport and a theater. And then you fly out again. Like you literally sleep because you're so exhausted. And now it's like, oh, I'm going to go someplace and it might be kind of cute to like sit there a little bit. Like and like look outside or I used to have a house in Tucson that I would escape to. I really liked Canyon. I had a house on the property of this hell spot called Canyon Ranch. Nice. So it was very fancy, a little too fancy. That's an, so not me, but I, at the time I needed it for my freaking ego. <laughs> and um, now I'm like, oh, after Phoenix, maybe I'll go to Scottsdale for a couple of days. That's cute. But like, it's cute. Like you don't go, oh, what can I accomplish? Like, what can I do there? Oh, I might like notice something. I might sit outside. I might like hang with the dogs, like whatever it is. So I think just taking that time and I'm not, you know, I'm a very spiritual person, but I don't meditate. I don't do yoga. I don't do anything you would think is a spiritual practice, but I just think you can live a spiritual way without putting those things on. Those are fine, but it's just not me, dude. You'll never see me sitting with my legs in that freaking lotus position. I'd rather kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's Yes, and, and I think that as you were talking about just enjoying those little things in life and sitting there and enjoying the moments, that's one of the things I know it's so much easier said than done because I am trying to do that. And sometimes I get caught up because my mind is thinking about, okay, what do I have to do next? I've got this big meeting or I've got this podcast or whatever. And sometimes I just feel like if I can sit there and enjoy the moment, it could make my life so much better. Well, you so. know, what's good is you're noticing, you're noticing that you're not doing it and it jogs you into doing it, which is great. You know, like I'll be sitting here sometimes and I have literally the cutest dogs in the world. They're both rescue. Uh -huh. One literally has my dad's face. One has my mom's face, meaning that the way they look at me, I'm like, oh, like my little evil one looks at me like my mother. My uh -huh. little angel looks at me like my dad. And it's so funny. And I noticed, why aren't I petting these dogs? Like, what? what like, <laughs> I notice it and I do it. But then they get too needy. And I'm like, okay, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> like, as long as we see it and we go, okay, dial it back in. But again, we're all work in progress. You know, Glennon Doyle said this great thing about she, every time she has a bad day, she's like, I need a new job. I need a new house. I need a new family i need to do this and she's like oh i just need water like I just need to drink water like sometimes all it is is as simple as that like what was it yesterday i was like in a mood and i was like what is wrong with me i'm like oh i'm starving sometimes you just need to eat breathe <laughs> walk whatever it is but we forget to do those little things and again i'm 59 i'm not new at this but i'm new at living like that Yes, yes. It's funny, too, because my wife and I, we also sometimes the communication of like, I 
am not able to tell her how I'm feeling, but I'm in a bad mood and vice versa. And so we ended up doing this code word or phrase where it's like, my flower is wilting. It needs to be watered. And right. so that used to be our sex code word, but now it's kind of like, I, I need <laughs> some love. I, yes, I like that though. You know, mine used to be when I was needed some alone time, <laughs> I would just yell, why the fuck do you live here? You know, it's not that <laughs> I do remember when Jimmy first moved in with me, I literally, he got, this was years ago. So there was this thing called the swine flu and he got it and couldn't leave the house. And I want in New York city, even a two bedroom apartment is too small for two people with big personalities, especially yeah. if one's freaking sick. So at one oh. point I did look at him. I, it was a set. I'll never forget it. Sunday around 3 PM. And I was, it was snowing out and I just screamed, why the are you always here? And he goes, I live here. I was like, don't remind me. <laughs> Went to Bed Bath & Beyond and got in a fight. You know, it's just like, <laughs> if you can't fight in a Bed Bath & Beyond, your life hasn't happened to you yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's a milestone in everyone's life, I feel. You got to get in an entanglement. 20% off coupon? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. And, and I... um. Speaking of anger, I also was listening to, maybe it was the last laugh podcast that I'd heard where you were talking about roasting and everything. And, and you were making the distinction that anger and insults are not the same, especially when roasting and then insult, there's, there's an art that comes to it. And it took you 20 years to be able to perfect the art of insulting someone right. without hurting their feelings. Yeah, because I don't think you can mean it, you know? I had so many, oh my God, an infiltrator is coming. Oh! God, Parker, this is uh, Parker. Hey, Parker. I named him after Sarah Jessica Parker because I was obsessed with sex in the city. Aww. Uh, face. They have yes. the same nose. This is great. Oh, no, I'm kidding. My mother's face who looks at me like I'm screwing him over by putting him in a home. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. And I oh my gosh, so guy. cute. Olson from Mad Men. I love Peggy Olson. But uh, yeah, I think like you just, as an insult comic, you cannot do it if you mean it. Again, that's why I'm Rickles and myself. The dumber the joke, the better. The more baseless and like sort of not clever is the way to go. So if you're saying something like Rickles used to say so bluntly, or I used to say bluntly, like, oh, the blacks. They steal. That's what they're known for, I would say. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Clearly, that's you'd have to be a racist dummy to believe that. So you can't right. do a whole clever bit about it. So that's why I think that takes some time to really suss out what your style is. So I love roasting, which mm -hmm. is my new show, the one that's in Phoenix. I like, okay, I need to put a roast in this show, but it's going to be about a roast about people who deserve it. Like, I really deserve it. Like, that if you are a human on this earth and you are breathing, you hate the people I'm roasting. And it could be individuals. It could be people who do awful things. Like, you know, one of them is, you know, the people who laugh at the special needs guy who's begging your groceries. The people who st stand people up for prom. This, that. I'm like, okay, if you don't think those people are evil, then get out of my show. So. Yeah. I like the fact that I can use that angry delivery roast thing that I love and that people like about me, uh -huh. but I get the right subjects down. I attack the right people. Oh, I see. I see. That's beautiful. And then going from like a, a, um, a person approach or kind of like general population approach to specific people, like when you're roasting Chevy Chase or Donald Trump. Um, yeah, like that I, to me, that's like, now it's like, there's no celebrity I know worth roasting. Yeah. Unless, as I said, you know, the only person I would ever come out of retirement for and would be for charity would be Howard Stern for the North Shore Animal League. Like if he said, yeah. oh, you know, can you roast them for charity? I'd be absolutely. But yeah. The fact is, the, the people, it's done. Uh, I'm clearly one of the best roasters. It doesn't matter. We don't have to prove anything. And that's a great thing. You don't have to prove anything anymore. Right. Know? Right. And one of the, I, I just have to say, my respect for you went even higher. And a lot of the other roasters, when seeing the, the, the Trump roast, where the situation came on, and then gave a rather cringeworthy 
uh, performance. And I was like, oh my God, like I, I did, I realized how there was a lot of work put into it, but then I heard it, maybe it was you on a podcast talking about all the preparation, the writers, the oh practicing God. for like five days in a hotel room. And yeah, like we're killing ourselves for 30 days at least. I'm getting hotel rooms weeks in advance to hang out with people that I employ to come up with the yeah. jokes and situation shows up without a suit. Basically, <gasps> the producer said to me, oh my God, I had to run out and get a suit for situation. I spent <gasps> months getting a dress made. And oh like, my God. This just proves a lack of respect. And the thing is entitlement because if you're so entitled that you're offered this opportunity and you squander it. So I don't ever mind if non roasters bomb, I mean, non comedians bomb, I feel sorry for them. But if you practice, I feel sorry for you. If you come in like that, I'm like, oh, you need to be made fun of a lot. Yes, I th I take the same stance because I had the feeling that it just, I feel like he walked there that day and was like, all right, let's do this. And from the confidence, like from the swagger that, it, that he had, I was like, oh, he's going to kill. But then, you know. Well, it's severe privilege. It's like, it's really, really white guy you know, entitled, famous for no reason privilege. And it's just like, oh, interesting how Betty White knew to show up in practice. Interesting how Snoop Dogg knew to show up in practice. It's interesting how Martha Stewart knew to show up in practice. But he, no, he doesn't need to do that. Okay. What a dummy. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, and, and I was also going to ask, too, because that's one of the things where I feel like I am, I like to be funny, but I, I, and I also care about people's feelings. So usually the target of the joke is not the person. Like perhaps if, if it was you and me, I wouldn't make fun of you or um, friends. I usually wouldn't make fun of them unless I really know them well. I, I mean, have there been, mo how have you been able to build up to that? Because I've been imagining if I try and do that, I'll just say something completely off color and I'll offend the person and then they won't want to talk with me again. I think you just in your gut know that you only make fun of the people you love. So for instance, if you're really good friends with me, I'm like, hey, and da da da, and the jokes just, I yeah. can't. Like, I call my two friends who I do the podcast with today. I mean, I yeah. call them, hey, fat meats things, hey, smell, <laughs> hey, whatever, hey, odor. Like, yeah, I, you just like hammer them because they know you couldn't possibly mean it. Right. But you ever notice when you're with a friend, you don't like that much and you're kind of afraid to say it because they're going to know you mean it? <laughs> so I just am like, I know that's, by the way, how I figure out who to dump as friends. That I like if if after thirty years, I don't feel like I can truly be myself with you and joke like that. Right. There's something off. It's us really not connecting. If we can't banter a little, there's too much seriousness going on. There's something being held back. So I legit like dumped a few people after COVID because I was like. I don't miss them because I don't miss this sort of fake me that I am with them. So I ghosted one because she didn't deserve an explanation. Cause she uh -huh. was, and I really, I made pretty clear. I don't like to be friends with alcoholics and I don't think it's nice to get a call at eight at night from a drunk. I just don't. <laughs> and the other one, it was an actual discussion, which was like, Oh, I guess this has outlived its usefulness, but I wish you nothing but the best. So COVID, I think, was really good for getting rid of the people and them getting rid of me, too. Mm -hmm. It's just something that wasn't clicking that you don't have that easy rapport with. Right, right. Yeah, that's a, I mean, I think back to what you were saying, it's a really good gauge of if you don't feel comfortable calling your friend a piece of shit, then they're probably a piece of shit and you can. Uh, that's exactly true, man. That's a, you yeah. put it really well. My <laughs> sister and I joke a lot. And what's funny is, um, we didn't always have the best relationship because, you know, in high school, she's the older one. I was like, oh, you know, she was like the narc, whatever. I'm like, oh, this is interesting how it's evolved into closeness. But also she said to me on a few occasions, don't use your humor against me. And I'm like, wow, at least she's saying what she wants. So it's, oh, I went a little too far. That wasn't cool. Uh -huh. But I think it's an openness that's really nice to have. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's really true. Um, and, and I'm sure everybody has 
I remember you talking about in the roast, for example, they would have some off limits subjects. And maybe there are some times where people have things that just get them the wrong way. And th I think that happens. So it's. Yeah, and the thing is, like I said, I think those guys would waste their time writing jokes about those things because they're never going to be put on TV. Yeah. Like, don't be a dummy. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your energy. Just work harder on the stuff we're allowed to make jokes about. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, well, just a couple more minutes to answer some advice questions. But before we get into that, just thank you, Lisa. This has been awesome. And I didn't realize I would be rolling in the deep with you this much. But this oh, has no been problem, man. Hey, it's a lucky coincidence. You started therapy and uh, we can jam about that. That's great. Oh, man, it's it's so uh, you're the first person I've told about it, actually, besides I my wife so yeah. now all of my listeners are going to know too so that's that's going to be uh hold you accountable now you have to be a, a good person yeah yes oh god <sighs> starting to sweat already um uh, well just a couple more minutes we're going to um answer some questions from reddit's advice column so these questions have come in from the advice column um this first one lisa it says how do i ask my boyfriend to stop putting up grandpa's art i 24 or year old female live in an apartment with my boyfriend, 25 year old male. His grandfather died a couple of years ago. He was an artist and a geologist. So he left a lot of rocks and paintings to my boyfriend. I really don't mind the rocks and maybe one or two paintings hanging, but he has about 10 of his paintings up now. It leaves no room for any other art. And I don't know how to tell him to take them down. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Wow, as someone who holds on to sentimental things, I understand the boyfriend's point of view a lot. Because I literally, if you saw this house right now, I said to myself, I'm going to get rid of everything that doesn't have sentimental value. I mean, even if it's a pot or a pan. Like, I basically go, oh, mom gave me this. Dad gave me this. Mm -hmm. Also, my dad was a fine artist. So 99% of the art is my father's and no one's here to argue with me about it. So I understand him. I have a suggestion for them because I'm really good at advice and not coaching. Ha ask him if he can rotate the art, meaning, honey, I've got a couple pictures I'd love to put up and I love all your grandfather's work. However, since I'd love to have room for mine, let's take four of yours down and then in the winter, we switch them out and you put up the ones that we didn't have up before. So, because that's what I'm going to have to do with my dad's art because there's so much, many paintings. I donated a bunch to a gallery. Mm -hmm. I want to constantly rotate them. So, it's a way of saying, hey, I count too, because that's basically the issue here. She wants to know she counts. Right. And it's a way of him going, I'm not dishonoring my grandfather by never putting these up again so i think the smart it's practical to do it that way and again I, we all just want to feel like we count and we're heard and there's nothing wrong with him leaving them up because that's how i am by the way the fact that she doesn't mind the rocks sh what's wrong with her like, I <laughs> throw those fucking rocks through a window i'm like are you kidding me a geologist I, I, she's putting up with a lot you know yeah that's i'm just imagining a giant boulder taking up the guest bedroom so they uh, can't have yeah, any visitors over. I had at one point someone thought because I went to a lot of meditation retreats yeah. that I liked crystals and geodes and shit, which I hate. I feel they, I'm, I'm, it's a highly unpopular view, but I don't think they have any energy. I don't feel any power from them. I want to, I re gifted that crap so fast. So the fact that she's putting up with that, bless her heart. Yeah, that's true. I so I guess I shouldn't give you the after show gift of you the crystals know. from. But the thing is, too, he will show his flexibility or inflexibility by this because that's a yeah. really valid, great solution. And sometimes you have to go. Well, is this a pink flag or red flag or not a flag at all? But it is knowing you're going to be dealing with somebody for a while who won't play ball if that's what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, and you know what? I really like the idea and I haven't thought of this maybe because as a guy, I'm so inattentive. I barely notice what's on the walls anyway, yeah. but changing them out. It's like a seasonal look. It's almost like, okay, I'm wearing spring colors. Cause it's spring. Now the house is yeah. going winter. Cause it's got 
grandpa's paintings on there and his rocks scattered about the house. I don't know where they are. <laughs> Get rid of the rocks, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's beautiful well great advice one more question from reddit it says my girlfriend wants to bang in a graveyard so yeah basically my new girlfriend wants me to bend her over a tombstone and while i can understand that this can be a massive turn on because of the taboo aspects it just doesn't sit well with me i'm not religious or anything but it's a place of mourning and that makes me feel incredibly uncomfortable any advice on how to deal with this wow this is rough because I also enjoy a cemetery, not a cemetery bang, but a oh, <laughs> okay. No, cemetery bang is disgusting. I remember playing in a graveyard with my cousins because when I was a kid, um, yeah, I was very close with my cousins and their house, the backyard. After the backyard, there was a cemetery, so we climb over the stone wall and play in the cemetery. So I do, and now I do, I was talking about this time, I love going to the cemetery, my dad, my grandparents, and because it's very peaceful. Yeah. And I do somebody banging and it's weird. I think <laughs> if anyone's uncomfortable with anything sexually, graveyard, wherever, beach, you just can't force yourself to do it. Like part of me is like, there's all these people like, just try it, just try it. I don't know. I think the minute you are uncomfortable it's something within you that maybe you can explore and get therapy on why you're uncomfortable but if it still comes back i still don't want to dishonor this place then you got to say no i'm more air on the side of let's pick five other places that you think are great and if i'm still uncomfortable maybe i'm not the right guy for you that, yeah, I think that's a good idea, too, where you could offer alternatives and be like, well, here are five other places. Hey, honey, maybe we can do it without grandpa's paintings all around us or yeah. without the rocks. Yeah, but the same people, by the way, the two letters are from the same people. <laughs> it's, it's so weird, though, this whole like, there's so much sexual freedom now, like everybody's like, you can't slut shame and this and that. And this and that. I mean, I grew up totally different where you slut shamed because... <laughs> You know, we're, yeah. we're like, it was in the sixties and or the seventies and like, Oh my God, she's a slut. And I'm like, yeah. So sex is so freaking charged now, but I think the minute you do something you don't want to do, you're going to resent that person and it's going to grow. So that's the thing. Work on it. Try to figure out why it bothers you. If you will do it resentfully, it's going to corrode the relationship. Yes, I, I definitely agree. And then if there are like steps, if you're willing to try it, steps to take that are like warm ups to it, like get a, a little casket and try in that perhaps. Bang in the casket. <laughs> Bang in, get there. <laughs> what you do, you get a little freaking gravestone. You put it in the backyard and bang in the backyard at the gravestone. Like it's a compromise. <laughs> like lady, calm down. What's with these women? My day, we didn't do no cemetery banging. <laughs> cemetery. Oh man, I real I'm imagining there probably is a Pornhub category of like cemetery banging. So oh, it's guaranteed they have everything. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and just like that, this podcast episode is now dead. But before we completely put it to rest. Lisa, again, I just wanted to say a huge thank you. And a link is going to be in the show notes to see your show for all you Phoenicians, perk up those ears and look in the show notes to get tickets. But beyond that, where, uh, where can people find you? What else have you got going on? What would you like to plug? I am somewhat on Instagram because I get a kick out of it. <laughs> at Lisa Lampanelli. I don't do a lot of it, but I do get a kick out of it. I think it's fun. So follow me at Lisa Lampanelli on all the social stuff. Nice. The show in Phoenix is called Sit Down and Shut Up. It's a storytelling and conversational show with a roast at the end. That'll be a big surprise. Big oh. reveal of my subject matter. Oh. And it's really a good show. Plus, I give some questionable half-assed advice like I did tonight. So that's why <laughs> this is, was a good combination for you and I to do this. Um, <laughs> so I guess for tickets, they go to where? Something in stand-up? Live. Yes, stand up live, and I'll have the link in the tickets uh, or the link in the show notes to get tickets Thank there. So too. And also, if you can't make that show, I am doing a live stream 
on April 24th. So go to my website, lisalampanelli.com. If you can't spell my name, sorry, I can't help you. You're too dumb to see my show. <laughs> I feel very uh, empathetic with you as, a, as another Italian that gets his name spelled wrong all the time. All the time. I had to change my name spelling to this. This is considered the easy version. So yeah, it's not cute. <laughs> but dude, this has been really fun. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And um, audience members, thank you guys for being such good listeners. And um, thank you again, Lisa. And we'll talk at you. Hopefully I'll see you at your show. My wife and I are going to be there. So Come back and say hi. Oh, awesome. Will do. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I hope you have a pleasant night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.